There's a Mwaka that is here in the house. Please, a round of applause for him. Comrade Gani Owoduni is here. Please, a round of applause for him. Comrade Dr. Brown Ogbefun is here. A round of applause for him. Comrade... He was once an aspirant. I'm, I'm trying to look for how to count that in the Edo governorship uh, election. <laughs> so we can call him His Excellency. <laughs> Comrade Peter Esele is here. A round of applause for him, please. He was also a TUC President General. Comrade Babatunde Ogun is also in the house. A round of applause for him. And we have... Uh, former general secretary that is also here with us. A round of applause for him, please. The name has keep my... Bayo Lowo Shile, please. A round of applause for him one more time. You see a lot of faces, you see a lot of people you try to... Please, I beg your pardon, for those who have their people here, please try and send the names across to us so that we can also uh, recognize you. Dr. Idewood Young Idemeko is here in the house, the managing partner of Wood Young Cine Consult and former PDP governorship aspirant in Akwaibom State. A round of applause for him. You're welcome. Sir. We have in our midst the former uh, the immediate past deputy president of Pengasan, and I love when I see Pengasan members or ESCOs grow in their fields. We have Comrade Owan Abua, who is now the manager, employee relations of NUPRC. A round of applause for him now. We have from the TUC family, I can see Fop Top uh, boss that is there. A round of applause for him, please. A round of applause for him. The first vice president of TUC is there, Dr. Kun. A round of applause for him, please. Just been corrected by the secretary general that is the first deputy president. We have to marry from our end to that end. Thank you very much. And the Secretary General of TUC is also seated. A round of applause for him, please. We will introduce the dignitaries as they come. Thank you. Mr. President, we are going to take the opening remarks. And of course, it will still come from the convener of this uh, 2023 Pengasan Energy and Labor Summit. Comrades, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our president, Comrade Engineer Festus Osifo, for his opening remarks. Solidarity. Solidarity. Great Pengasan. Great Pengasan, credit a lot to one, credit a lot to one, credit a lot to women, women are great, our agenda, train a woman, Educate a woman, our agenda, solidarity, great Nigerian workers, ever conscious Nigerian workers, ever hardworking Nigerian workers, ever intelligent Nigerian workers, greatest of the greatest of the greatest Nigerian workers. Uh, the Thank you so much, comrades. Although the master of the ceremony has established the protocol, but I will be fine if I don't respectfully uh, say, uh, I mean, recognize one or two persons that are here, most especially our daddies that have been here since yesterday. 
Uh, we call them the conscience of Pengasan because uh, they are the people that ensure that we are here today. Most of the CBAs, most of the collective bargaining agreements that you enjoy today in the industry predated us. In fact, when a lot of us, when we are employed in our respective places of work, we met a good condition of service. And this wouldn't have been possible if not for the light of our elder, I mean, uh, few of them are not here. I think about two or three of them are not here. Uh, but uh, here we have our elder, uh, past president of Pengasan. I recognize you, sir. Pa Austin Ezewanka is the high chief. Uh, we have um, elder comrade Gani Owoduni. He was the president of Pengasan during June 12. Hope you all understand what that means. Uh, we have uh, our elder, Dr. Brown Ugbefun, popularly referred to as Godfather. We appreciate you. Then when the MC was introduced, forever, when the MC was introducing our, our own daddy and elder brother, he said he was formerly a governorship aspirant, that we should call him His Excellency. Maybe we'll call him His Excellency in waiting. <laughs> we appreciate you, sir, for all that you have done, uh, Comrade uh, Peter Esele. Past President Pengasan, Past President Trade Union Congress of Nigeria. Then also we have Komri Babatunde Ogund, who was a two-term president of Pengasan. He spent six years as president of Pengasan uh, between 2008 and 2014. Then we have our elder at 12, Comrade uh, Bayo Olowushile, who was a former general secretary of Pengasan. We appreciate you. We appreciate all the support. We appreciate everything that you have done in the past. In fact, um, um, Comrade Shino, who was the president before the Godfather, said something that if you are president of Pengasan and you left that position without a high BP, you have to go and do a serious thanksgiving. That because um, to hold that position for just one day, the stress and the, um, the rigor that comes with it is quite enormous. But seeing all of you dressed so beautifully and Gracing all our functions, we are extremely happy and we thank God for life and we thank God for good health. Thank you all for all you do. We really appreciate you. Uh, the uh, members of uh, the NAC of Trade Union Congress of Nigeria, the President of Association of Senior Civil Servants, uh, the dep also the Deputy President, one of TUC, President of FOCTOB, who is also DP3 of TUC. We quite recognize you. Thank you. Uh, you've been here since yesterday. The General Secretary of TUC, we appreciate you, thank you. The Auditor of TUC, we quite appreciate you all for the strong solidarity that you have shown to the Pengasan family, we appreciate you. Uh, the CWC members of TUC, the General Secretary, the Deputy President, and all other members, the National IRO, uh, the National Treasurer of Pengasan, we appreciate you all. Uh, for all the solidarity, I mean, uh, that we have shown and the commentary that we've put together to get this program underway. And also uh, our invited guests. And just before that, I, you know, when I came in earlier, I met the former deputy president of TUC. He sat at the, at the invited guest corner. I said, I know, Comrade Owen, you cannot be sitting here. You were just part of us a few, few days ago. I mean, he's someone that has put a lot into this movement as well, former deputy president of Pengasan, Comrade Owen Abwa. We quite appreciate you. You're welcome. Then all other NEC members that are here, we appreciate you. Our women, know, we appreciate you for all that you have stood for, you know, uh, for this um, association. Then the formal, we have a lot of former CWC members here. I could see our former uh, Potako Zona chairman, Comrade Otono. I could see uh, the immediate past chairman, a very forever, a very strong chairman from Warizon who just retired from service just about, just less than one month ago. Uh, comrade Audo Shokomale, popularly referred to as Chokomilo. We, we quite appreciate you. Uh, all the uh, dignitaries that are here, um, the ED uh, from NMDPRO, a corporate services, our Comrade Sadiq. Uh, thank you so much for always being uh, present. Then also to our very uh, own, we quite appreciate you, sir, for all that you've done for the movement and for all the support you've given to us. So, comrades, I wish to welcome every one of us. Uh, to this event. I could see a lot of state TUC chairmen. We, we appreciate you all. 
And thank you for the solidarity that we have shown uh, since yesterday. But just to, sh just to state a few things at all, uh, because yesterday we listened to lots of, lot of announcements and lots of uh, policy statements that were made on this particular platform. You know, uh, today, as we all know, that we have the issues that are bothering us as a country, issues that are dependent on the regulation of the downstream sector of the oil and gas industry. And also, you know, when the deregulation actually came, when the pronouncement was made on May 29th uh, at the Eagle Square, uh, a lot of us did not really understand the implications. You know, over the years, the labor movement have been steadfast on the positions of what they think could be done before government could go into deregulation. You know, and a lot of these has been stated in the past. You know, things about, I mean, things to put in place. The, for the short term, the medium term, and for the long term. This has been established. And also yesterday, you heard when the panelists came, they also made some far-reaching comments on some of far-reaching proposals on what could be done in order to alleviate the sufferings that Nigerians are passing through today. And you could see labor leaders, both in the past and in the now, are all in sync on what could be done. In the, medium, in, in the short term, you could talk about palliatives. In the medium term, you must be able to design a good transportation system for our country because that is key and that is necessary because today, I can tell you that there are some people that sleep at their place of work. What they do is that on Monday, they will come, they live in suburbs, ask us of Abuja, ask us of Lagos, and ask us of most mega cities in Nigeria. So what do happen is that on Monday, they come to work, they come with all their clothes that they are going to put on for the entire week. So they remain in their office place till Friday. It is not Friday that they will go back home. And I mean, these are the realities that we are currently living in as a country. So as government, we have always consistently called on them for them to be up and doing because they have always asked Nigerians to sacrifice. They have always asked Nigerians to tighten their belt. But as government, they are living in affluence. We have told them and we have asked them, what are those adjustments that you have to make as government? What are those, I mean, cost of living, are, are, adjustment and the cost of governance you have to reduce your cost of governance because you cannot continuously live you know as business as usual you cannot continuously do things the way it was done in the past and you are not telling the generality of the people that they have to tighten their belt and as an association Pengasan, we must um, also come up with policy statements on the things and hold government accountable because government at the end of the day must cut and reduce the cost of governance. Because if you don't reduce the cost of governance, you will not have enough fund to be able to channel into the productive areas of the economy. Yesterday, we talked about provision of infrastructures. We talked about provision of healthcare, provision of education. But all these cannot be done if you continuously expand government. We have seen the government of today. Appointments are endless. You have a particular government as of today. They have appointed nothing less than five or six aides on media alone. So we think that as government, what we should be thinking today is how to shrink governance. And as you could recall at all, we have 48 ministers today. And there are still three. We don't know if they will still be cleared. And that could take the tally to 51. And these ministers, at the end of the day, they are going to recruit aides, they are going to recruit PAs, and PA to PA, and aides to PA. Before you know, that, back, um, that uh, government size is going to bloat at all. Yesterday at all, we talked about innocent, for example. In the United States of America, when George Bush was there, George Bush Jr., as well as Barack Obama, we all knew how they bailed out the auto industry. So part of what we have also demanded in the discussions we'll be having with government is that no, what you should do, innocent today, there's a limitation in the number of vehicles innocent can produce. We have had discussions with them. So these limitations are real. These limitations are there. But as government, what is the support that you are giving to them? Because uh, if you say innocent today can produce like a thousand bus, buses per year, you could assist them in order to get loans at single digit interest rates. You could also bail them out as well by giving them grants for them to expand their assemblies and for them to expand their production facility. 
Uh, because if this is not done, uh, their capacity will be the way it is today. They will not be able to meet the yearnings of Nigerians. So these are some of the things that we have actually been asking. And as Pengasan, we are going to push consistently to ensure that these and many more are done. So comrades, I welcome you all to today's, um, to today's section. And I am very optimistic, I'm very sure that today's section is going to be as enriching as it was yesterday, if not much more. So I enjoy us to relax, uh, take our seats, you know, take uh, some bottle of water, and I can assure you that at the end of the day, as an individual, we'll be much more enlightened and we will be much more informed. Solidarity. Thank you so much, comrades. Thank you. Please, can we put our hands together for the president of Pengasan? Engineer Festus Osifo. Thank you very much. Mr. President, we have some introductions to do further before we proceed to the next item on the agenda. We have the GM of HR in OES DFC Limited, Dominic Ajabo, that is here. A round of applause for him, please. Can you just wave? You're most welcome, sir. Mr. President, while you were still speaking, I, I, would, like, I would gladly say my own came in, and um, <laughs> I want to start by introducing first the executive director and the GM of HR in Mobile Producing Nigeria, uh, Dr. Balarabe Aliyu. He's also the chairman of OPTS HR Sub uh, Committee. Please, a round of applause for him. And one of the uh, key discussions this morning has also come in is the Executive Director of Production, Mobile Producing Nigeria Limited. Please help me welcome Jagger Bagzi that is here with us. A round of applause for him. You're welcome, sir. Mr. President, so that I will be invited for the next meet program you have, I will not fail to introduce uh, this man, because if I do, I may likely not be invited, except you veto that invitation. And I'm talking about the Chairman Central Planning Committee of this 2023 Pengasan Energy and Labor Summit, Comrade Pastor Kings Udoidua. A round of applause for him, please. Also, I'm told that Dr. Issa Sambo, who is the GM NNRA, is here with us. Please, wherever he is, a round of applause for him. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome, sir. He will also give us a keynote address today. The manager, HR, and mean for Chevron, who is representing the chairman and MD of that company, Izuchuku Agulefo, is still with us. He was here yesterday, he's here with us today. A round of applause for him, please. Thank you. We're going to take the keynote speech on regulatory framework an effective policy alignment and implementation for a transparent need and downstream market. But before we do that, uh, let me just take one more introduction, and that is uh, the Honorable Commissioner for Energy and Solid Minerals in Ondo State is still here with us. Please help me welcome Engineer Comrade Razak Obey. That is a product I'm proud to say of ExxonMobil Nigeria. Thank you. Comrades, we're going to take the keynote speech from the executive Authority Chief Executive, I have to be very careful so that I don't want to make a mistake, of Nigeria Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority. He is ably represented here by 
Bashir Sadiq is the executive director, corporate services and administration of the same industry. A round of applause for him, please, as he comes up to give us the keynote address. A round of applause as he comes up, please. Please, let's clap till he gets up here. Red Pengasan. Mr. President, Engineer Festus Osifo, members of the NAC of the Pengasan, I think uh, it would be futile for me to try to recognize everyone because the president has done a very excellent job of that. So allow me to stand on the protocols that he established. I'm here this morning to represent my chief executive, engineer Farouk Ahmed, who is unavoidably absent. He has prior engagement that uh, kept him away from this very important occasion. So my apologies on his behalf. I will try as much as possible to convey the message that he sent me to read to you. Uh, definitely it's not going to be uh, as if he did it himself, but I will try as much as possible to convey the, the, the message. Obviously, uh, the Pengerson is a very important partner to us in the NMDPRA, and we appreciate the cooperation we enjoyed, especially from the president and his NAC and our in-house union. We also appreciate the national body I just learned yesterday that my branch chairman was recognized by the association. We thank you very much. And that particularly gladdened my heart personally because the union are the ones that we work closely with in corporate services and administration. And in the last two years, it is a testimony to the fact that we have had very cordial working relationship with our union that we have not had any industrial incident relating to our very important asset, which is the human capital that we manage. And it is a great testimony to the efforts of the president and our branch uh, members. We thank you very much for that. Having said that, I will go ahead to read the keynote address of Engineer Farouk on regulatory framework, effective policy alignment, implementation for a transparent mid and downstream market in Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to deliver this keynote address to this august audience of indefatigable comrades, workers, and pillars of the Nigerian oil and gas industry. I must congratulate the organizers, Pengerson, of this event, whose efforts and commitment to value creation have provided this platform for all key stakeholders to contemplate and elaborate on policy directions deliberate on industry challenges and chart a path forward for the growth of the Nigerian economy and the Nigerian oil industry. This effort is a testament to the fact that Pengerson, as an organized labor group 
remains a very vital component of our nation building efforts in Nigeria. The general team of this summit, Petroleum Industry Deregulation and Gas Utilization for a Sustainable Energy Future in Nigeria is consistent with the strategic agenda of the government and leadership in the energy sector. It underscores the desire of government to liberalize downstream industry and use our God-endowed gas resource as transition fuel and a vehicle for our developmental inspiration as a nation. The sub-theme, regulatory framework, effective policy alignment and implementation for a transparent mid and downstream market, which I am discussing today, is very important aspect of Nigerian energy ecosystem. And I thank you for carefully selecting this strategic topic for this year's Labor Summit. Now, talking about mid and downstream sector of the oil and gas industry. The mid and downstream sector of the energy industry are vital components of our economy and implementation of effective policies and regulatory frameworks that ensure transparency in the sector are critical drivers required to develop a successful sector that will promote investment, deliver energy security, and ensure sustainable economic development for Nigeria. The mid and downstream sectors of the oil and gas industry value chain encompass various activities. These activities include refining, processing of natural gas, distribution, storage, and marketing of petroleum products, and other energy products obtainable from oil and gas resource. While Nigeria is greatly endowed with abundant reserves of crude oil in excess of 37 billion uh, barrels of reserves and about 206 trillion cubic feet of gas, preponderance of the produced resources are exported without processing. The country needs a very robust midstream mid and downstream sector to maximize the inherent values that can be derived from these resources. The mid and downstream sector is where the most value is created. These created values are in form of employment for our teaming youth, accelerated industrialization that is brought about by building this uh, midstream uh, facilities and security of energy which is needed for economic growth and it also gives the added advantage of generating revenue both for the investors and for the government of the of Nigeria now why is transparency uh, important in midstream and downstream sector a transparent mid and downstream market attracts investment it promotes efficiency it promotes competition and is a vehicle for sustainable development. So it is very uh, capital goals where it is most needed and where there is transparency. So achieving transparency requires some key components such as effective laws, clear sectoral policies and strategic objectives, sound regulatory frameworks, optimal enforcement, and compliance to regulatory requirements. And this is where NMDPRA comes in as a regulator in the oil and gas industry. The PIA, which is currently the governing legislative instrument that defines the key regulatory frameworks of the mid and downstream industry has made substantial provisions that will guarantee optimal transparency in the operations of the, sector, of the sector. Such provisions include one, clear terms and condition applicable for issuance of mid and downstream operational licenses. These conditions are clear. Uh, it also requires us to publicize operational data and reports on midstream, uh, mid and downstream operations. It also provided for implementation of open access regimes 
such that there won't be monopoly of critical infrastructure that is needed to move the products that are produced from the uh, midstream industries. It also provided for market competitive uh, rules that support sustainable growth of the sector and protect the consumer. It demand for optimal stakeholder involvement in implementation of key regulatory roles, such as formulation of regulations and key market oversight activities. As a matter of fact, Section 216 of the PIA, if I am not mistaken, provided that for any before any regulation comes into effect, we must have extensive stakeholder consultation. And that is some of the provisions that entrench transparency in the uh, midstream sector. The NMDPRA is working with all its stakeholders to effectively develop a transparent midstream and downstream sector in line with the mandates defined in the PIA. And it is my pleasure, I am glad, to inform you that we have achieved remarkable progress in this regard through our extensive stakeholder consultation during the formulation and the rollout of regulations that are already in force. Having said all that, I want to take us through the regulatory framework and the effective policy alignment and implementation that we are going through in the mid and downstream uh, sector. Through the successful implementation of PIA 2021, we are able to roll out regulations that are the roadmap towards a vibrant midstream and downstream sector of the oil and gas industry. The alignment and effective implementation of these policies and frameworks will undoubtedly ensure transparency in the industry and guarantee a sustainable energy future for Nigeria. Now, there are, of course, some uh, issues that had to be dealt with as a result of implementation of the uh, new law, that is the PIA 2021. And among the most discussed, of course, is the fuel subsidy remover. Well, uh, on fuel subsidy removal, as we are all aware, Nigeria's energy changing landscape requires clear and stable policy frameworks, appropriate governance structures, secured operating environment, availability of in-country competences, as we have ample of them in the Pengasun, there is no level of competence that you will need that can, you can't find in Pengasun, and we are, we are first to, to recognize that, yes. You know. And then, of course, we need long-term affordable financing and purposeful leadership at all levels. This is necessary to encourage and promote sustainable investment across the value chain and guarantee predictability because nobody will want to invest in a long-term project when he cannot plan. So predictability is very important and this can only be provided when there are clear uh, and transparent regulations and guidance uh, from the, especially from the authority. To entrench this, in August 16, on August 16, 2021, the then president signed into law the Petroleum Industry Bill, which has been long awaited and which has been in the work for over 20 years. What that means is it ushered in a milestone and a dawn in the history of the growth and prosperity of the Nigerian oil and gas through key industry reforms, which include the removal of subsidy, migration to a full market-based pricing for petroleum products, which is only way to attain a transparent mid and downstream value chain for petroleum products. Although the full deregulation of the sector came into full effect on 29 May 2023, 
as part of the current administration courageous and bold commitment to implement much needed reforms it will be appropriate to share some Niger some of nigeria's experience with fuel subsidies and the compelling case for implementation of this new midstream and downstream policy restructuring the group ceo yesterday very eloquently uh, stated all the case to this audience on why fuel subsidy has to go. I, I don't think I, I need to repeat that, but that is a, from the point of in, uh, commercial point of view. As a regulator and as part of the government, uh, I will I will confine myself to just a few anecdotes that, that point out what we have been through as a government in relation to fuel subsidy administration over the years. As we are all aware, uh, I think a lot of the, uh, some of the people in the audience know this better than I do, but subsidy issue has been with us since the 1970s when the government decided to make this product available to Nigerians at cost below market prices. As years go by and the subsidy bill ballooned, the government introduced the Petroleum Support Fund. That was in 2003. And the, uh, the reason uh, for introducing Petroleum Support Fund is to pay back to importers the difference between the landing cost and what, uh, what the uh, retail price is. And as time goes by, like I mentioned, this bill continued ball ballooning until a time when the Petroleum Support Fund, which is a fund uh, uh, that the three tiers of government contributed into, can no longer cover the differentials between the landing cost and the uh, retail price, the regulated retail price. And around 2016, another iteration was introduced called the price modulation mechanism. The price modulation uh, mechanism also did not work, and subsequently another appropriate pricing mechanism was introduced. And what that does is to allow marketers bring in product, put in some margin for themselves, and sell to the public at prices, at price bands that are determined by, by the government. Unfortunately, the oil marketing companies couldn't import due to mostly challenges with procuring uh, foreign exchange. Because at that time, there are various um, uh, there are various prices for 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 the dollar you know there is the open market price there is the cbm price and all that and not everybody can have access to the official uh, official uh, prices for the for the dollar and that falters as well and as a result of that the nnpc had to step in to guarantee supply of the commodity through its direct sell, direct purchase mechanism. And that is how it has been up till May 2023. While acknowledging the social benefits of PMS subsidy in Nigeria, the fiscal burden, this has been uh, explained here by the GCUO that mentioned that at a point in time, the monthly bill for subsidy runs to about 400 billion per month. That is unsustainable. And as a result, as a result, the government come to the realization that the only way to ensure continued availability of this product is to operationalize market-based pricing environment for all petroleum products. And that was what government did on 29th May 2023. The subsidy regime in Nigeria, as 
we all know, created a situation where a substantial regional PMS retail pricing differential incentivized cross-border smuggling. I have mentioned the financial cost, and in the same vein, perennial challenge of the fuel subsidy, which was over the years, over the years has encouraged inefficiencies, waste and environmental pollution, and it has become a major bottleneck bottleneck for aligning our country to the sustainable development uh, goals of providing cleaner energy while uh, retaining the environment for our future generation. The complete deregulation of the downstream sector is therefore being implemented through regulatory and policy framework that, is, that will cut across all of relevant government organization in strong collaboration with the private sector. Transparency across the entire value chain of the downstream sector has been greatly enhanced and the expected impact of improved midstream sector will be created in the near term through increased domestic refining capacity in Nigeria. And if I may mention, we may, uh, we may go back a little, a step back, to note that due to the subsidy inefficiencies, we, in the last several years, we have granted a license to establish refineries, but none of them, most of them did not come to fruition. The simple reason is that you don't want to produce a product that you will not be able to sell at market prices. And the few ones that are able to pick up these licenses and establish modular refineries, they make sure that they produce products that are being sold at market prices, such as AGO and some of them even NAFTA, which they eventually export. So, Subsidy has created a dilemma for the country such that it is impossible for midstream operators to establish refineries because they are not sure of getting uh, the right prices for the product that they will produce. And this brings me to the efforts of government to, to somehow cushion the effect of subsidy removal. And one of the several uh, efforts of government and programs that they put in place to lessen the effect on common man is the introduction of gas as an alternative fuel, as an alternative to, uh, to PMS. And there are various initiatives that the government championed, and one of them it started with the year of gas in 2020, which metamorphosed into the decade of gas program. Uh, these are all strategic policy initiatives geared towards alleviating the effect of subsidy removal on PMS. And as Nigeria made these efforts and seek to utilize its extensive gas resource to, to accomplish the following strategic energy objectives within the decades. Number one, to incentivize grow, to incentivize and grow the three strategic domestic gas sectors, namely gas to power, gas-based industries, and gas to commercial, with the intended outcome of developing a fully mature domestic gas market. The government also the government also want to accelerate the growth of critical gas infrastructure, and uh, there are a lot of provisions in the PIA that support that. For us, in the NMDPRA, we have the midstream and downstream gas infrastructure fund, which is there to support uh, high-risk projects in, uh, in gas infrastructure. We all, uh, the government also in place cost-reflective pricing and tariffing mechanism. This is uh, very important because if the domestic 
gas market prices are not comparable with the international market, the oil companies will not invest in gas production or gas supply. And it is important that they are guaranteed at least a base price. And Schedule 4 of the PIA provided for a mechanism to, uh, to draw a domestic gas base price by the NMDPRA on an annual basis, reflective of cost of production and cost of transportation and the like, so that at the end of the day, when gas gets to the end user, it will be uh, at a price that is affordable and at a price that will ensure that the producers recoup their investment in the production and delivery of the gas. Also, some of the progress is some of the progress that we made so far is we have achieved some milestone in critical infrastructural development when it relating to gas, such as the OB3 pipeline, the AKK, and also the rehabilitation of the ELPS, Escrabos Lagos pipeline system for delivery of gas. We have also revised and uh, we, we have issued the gas prices and tariffs, and we are also working on the Nigerian Gas Network uh, Transportation Network Code. We have also commenced the review of new gas supply projects, and only a couple of weeks ago, we have issued a wholesale gas supply license to one of the local companies. And these are all in an effort to provide alternative source of energy for our teaming population. The auto gas and domestic LPG programs are also being implemented for deepening utilization of gas in a manner that supports the availability of cheaper and cleaner uh, alternative energy sources for Nigerians. These programs are, have, directed, have direct linkage to the removal of subsidy on PMS, and the federal government is collaborating with its partners to provide CNG-powered mass transit vehicles, and, uh, I, and it pleased me to mention that we also signed an MOU between NMDPRA and one of the local companies that will eventually provide about 1,000 CNG-powered buses for mass transit in the country. Another effort of the um, government towards alleviating and securing energy provision in the country is the provision of the Petroleum Product National Strategic Stock. This, was a, this is a provision of the PIA, uh, specifically Section 206, if I'm not uh, mistaken, which is also a public service obligation on the part of the industry. And what it does is, when fully implemented uh, with the regulatory uh, framework, NSS will guarantee availability of petroleum products such as PMS across Nigeria at competitive and affordable price regimes during global or national supply crisis. The appropriate regulation for the emplacement of an effective national strategic stock regime is being finalized and it will be launched in due course. I'm sure that, uh, President, we will invite you to that lunch uh, when it is ready. Key regulatory frameworks being implemented by the NMDPRA. At this point, let me emphasize that the mid and downstream market is being established through key policies and strategic government programs that will ensure a sustainable energy future for Nigeria and the NMDPRA is pivotal in the implementation of all relevant regulatory frameworks required for the sector. Key regulatory frameworks that are supporting the major policy reforms of the mid and downstream markets include, one, we have issued 20 gazetted 
critical regulations for mid and downstream sector, and these regulations were developed transparently with the full cooperation of the industry. We have in place new license regimes for the mid and downstream market operations such as wholesale gas uh, supplier license, which I mentioned a moment ago. We have developed other strategic new license regimes that are being finalized, such as gas trading license, gas trading clear, clearing warehouse license, and gas distribution license, among others. Another key regulatory framework that is supporting the effective implementation of mid and downstream policies is the emplacement of new pricing and tariffing frameworks for gas. The NMDPRA is also collaborating with all stakeholders to ensure that these, frame, these regulatory frameworks promote optimal market performance and transparency. We are also using technology to enhance monitoring monitoring regimes of technical operations and commercial activities in the mid and downstream activities. All these policies are geared towards um, protecting the consumer and also protecting the investor so that they can get return on their investment so that the industry can be sustainable. We have enhanced open access uh, operational frameworks and we are excited with the announcement by NNPC of concession of some of their pipelines. We want to see how that goes so that we can have a vile, virile um, transportation system for petroleum products in the country. We are also not forgetting about the safety of operations. So we are also enhancing the development of safety standards so that we can protect our environment, and also uh, protect the investors' assets. We have in place market information management system so that we will have something to benchmark prices in the country and make sure that they are not exploitative. We are also working with the, uh, with the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission all in an effort to make sure that prices are consumer friendly. We don't want any Nigerian to be exploited. While we want uh, people to invest in the industry, we are not willing to sacrifice the interests of our countrymen. So we are working with the Federal uh, Competition and Consumer Protection Commission on that note. In conclusion, the role of collaboration and dialogue amongst the key players in the energy sector is required for development of stable energy markets, energy security, and sustainability. A transparent mid and downstream market is not just a regulatory imperative. It is the cornerstone for a thriving, competitive, and sustainable energy industry. We at the NNDPRA will be central to ensuring that all policies being implemented in the mid and downstream markets enjoy optimal regulatory support through the implementation of various regulatory frameworks reviewed in this address. We shall continue to engage and collaborate with the unions in all relevant areas of mid and downstream growth, including policy research and capacity building. I think it is important for me to mention at this juncture that we can see a lot of differences brought about by the leadership of President Festus Osifo. And one of these is at, <laughs> one of these are events like this. So our union has graduated from a union that is only concerned about the welfare of staff to a union that is very much involved in nation building. <laughs> this is commendable and it is a testament to the leadership of the union as currently composed and we thank you very much for this. We know that uh, it is a great sacrifice. Leadership in this country is not easy, but 
you are on the right course. If we continue like this, with gathering like this, where ideas are exchanged, I believe that we have a very good future for this country. I thank you very much. And please accept the warmest regards of the Authority Chief Executive Engineer, Farouk Ahmed. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Please, let's put our hands together for Engineer Bashir Farouk. Thank you so much for representing the Authority Chief Executive excellently well and delivering the keynote address on his behalf. President of Pengasan, we're still going to take one or two introductions before we go into the panel discussion. We have Mrs. Christiana Akin Dole. She is a representative of the MD of PHRC, the Portacot Refinery Company Limited. A round of applause for her. You're welcome. Just been informed that Dr. Tom Harry, executive member of Nigerian Association of Petroleum Explorationists, is in that building. Please, a round of applause for him. Dr. Tom, you are most welcome. Just walking in while the Executive Secretary's keynote address was ongoing is Dr. Zainab Gobir. She is the Executive Director in NMDPRA. A round of applause for her, please. You are most welcome. We're going to go into the panel discussion. To lead that first discussion today is the Chairman of the Planning Committee, Please, let's welcome Comrade Pastor Kings Udoidwa to come and introduce the member of the panel. A round of applause for him, please, as he comes up. The President Bengasan, may I respectfully stand on all existing protocols. Um, we have a, a panel discussion today on uh, downstream deregulation, enhancement, is it an enhancement of opportunities or a decline in career progression? And to join me on set very quickly, let's make welcome Dr. Oyet Gogomeri, GM NMPC Retail, who is representing the Managing Director, Mr. Hobbs Stokeman. Very quickly following that is Dr. Tom Harry, Director, AXU Consultancy, and also the Executive Member of NAPE. <laughs> Let's make welcome the immediate past Deputy President Pengasan and the Head of Employee, now the Head of Employee Relations, NUPRC, Engineer Owan Abwa. Very quickly, so let's make welcome the MD of Better West Nigeria Limited, Dr. Victor Dare. I'll be your anchor today, and very quickly, so I want to step to the podium. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome each and every one of us to this panel discussion. Okay, this is a critical discussion as far as this summit is concerned. Over the course of history, we've seen a lot of changes in the industry as new opportunities exist for government and for investors. New strategy of deployment of their workforce is also ensued. One of the concerns for labor has been that each time there is a change, in strategy. The people at the receiving end of some of those change are the workers. The oil and gas industry is ever involving with more cry for uh, energy transition, moving away from fossil dependence on um, gas 
And the question, the big question is, with the deregulation facing us as a people, what is the implication to the workforce? What is the implication to labor vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the coming of new ways of working and doing business? And that is the business that we are having here today. And we are going to delve into some of these present issues, downstream deregulation and enhancement of opportunity. And our panelists, are, as you heard in the introduction, are experts in the industry, some drawn from the academia, some from uh, currently practicing. And so very quickly, and to kick start, uh, kick start the conversation today, let's consider some of our global uh, landscape. According to the International Energy Agency, in 2022, the global energy demand rebounded very quickly to pre-pandemic levels. You know, during the pandemic, energy demand had reduced, but after the pandemic, there's been a, a resurgence in, in production and the demands that followed. And especially with the war in Ukraine, uh, between Ukraine and Russia, the, what follows naturally is the fact that Russia is not able to meet the demands of Europe, or they are not willing to. So many people are getting into the business taking opportunity of that. My first question is to my far right, Dr. Victor Dare. How does this resurgence in energy demand intersect with our downstream deregulation, and what opportunities does it present for career growth? 